Hello everyone from the Novetch team. Welcome to today's webinar, Predicting Designs with Physically Based Rendering. Today you will see how interactive physically based rendering can expand your design insight by giving a true prediction of your creations as you make decisions. We will explore uh, the latest NVIDIA iRay offerings for 3x Max, Maya, Cinema 4D, and Rhino, along with how Mental Ray for Maya is transforming M&E production with a 20 times speed up. Today's presenter, Philip Miller, leads NVIDIA's product management team producing commercial rendering products. He has uh, over 20 years experience in guiding industry leading tools for creative professionals at Autodesk, Adobe and NVIDIA. He's also a registered architect and best-selling author on 3D modeling, animation and rendering. Before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Novage. Novage is the is one of the largest online stores for design software. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's needs. So visit, at, visit us at novage.com and check it out. For more daily software news and limited time promotions, pay a visit to the Novage blog and follow us on Facebook, Google Plus and Twitter. And last but not, oh, I forgot to let you know that next week we'll have a webinar on Visual Arc 2.0, Flexible BIM for Rhino. And uh, last but not least, today's webinar is free and is also being recorded. So if you want to rewatch this webinar or any other webinar episode in our collection, just head on over to Novage's YouTube and Vimeo channels. And now I'll stop talking and start showing fill screen. Enjoy. Okay, uh, thank you for the nice introduction and welcome everybody. Uh, today we're going to be talking about physically based rendering, uh, wh what it means to you, what, it, what possibilities you can use to exploit it, and um, as well as the offerings coming from NVIDIA to help you there. This is an example, let me see here. Are you seeing this panel? Are you Yes. Do you We're seeing okay. an image of yeah, okay, a nice just the image room. not the not the, you're not seeing the go to webinar. No, 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 no. Only okay. you see that. Okay, okay, great, great. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this was an image that we 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 uh, published um, several years ago that really got people's attention. Um, it, it turned out that it was our most popular blog post ever, and it simply said, you know, which one is a photograph and which one is an IRA rendering. Um, it in practice it was a nearly a 50-50 split on the choice. Uh, tens of thousands of people entered, and it really showed you that you could not tell the difference. You could tell differences between the images, but you couldn't really tell which was more accurate than the other. Um, and it was amazing seeing the amount of dialogue that went around it. Um, if you're case you're wondering, that one was the IRA image. So coming back again. Um, so let's talk more about what we're really seeing when we're seeing rendering of that quality. If you've been experienced with rendering over the last few years, even the last few decades, you've seen it evolve from basic shading to uh, other ways of approximating light. And in doing so, these were all approximations um, that got you closer and closer to realism. But in doing so, it made the practice of achieving that image more and more complicated, because these were all ways of, simul uh, of approximating rather than simulating. There was, however, a true way of doing it, which was physically based rendering, physical based ray tracing. And this kind of reversed the whole ratio of complexity. Uh, it actually became much easier to use. The realism went up, up much higher. Um, and it really completely reversed what was otherwise an inevitable trend. But this wasn't exactly for, for free. Because as you grew in this area, the amount of computation that re was required uh, g grew along with it. Um, but that's why we've been investing in, in it at NVIDIA, because it turns out this approach is highly parallel, which is a great match for uh, parallel processors like NVIDIA's GPUs. So while 
the algorithms become that much harder to do, we make it that much faster to process, and suddenly we have a solution that is uh, uh, very ready to adopt. An example of this in practice, uh, one of our uh, uh, rendering partners is Pixar. Um, this is an example of one of the scenes that they did for Toy Story 3. This was the actual scene, and to the right was the actual lighting setup that they had at Pixar. Um, with over 300 empirical lights to represent the lighting that was actually in the scene on the left. When they switched this over to their new lighting model, which is uh, physically based, they simply had six lights within the, w within the room and one for the outdoor scene, and that was it. Uh, a completely different way of managing the complexity of your scene. Um, and this is why it's sweeping not just uh, the design industry, but also the studio industry as well as an approach. And this is now becomes an interactive lighting tool that we're working on with, with Pixar uh, with. So in practice, it actually is very simple. You think about how light and materials work in the world around you, and you assign them accordingly. You don't have to think about computer graphic tricks. For example, putting lights below the floor to light the ceiling. You never do that again. You simply assign the materials that are, that, that we, that are, are appropriate, uh, the lighting that's appropriate. In this case, all the lighting is coming from the outside scene, uh, outside uh, window. And then you click render, and you get this result with no additional tweaking in between. So that's what we want to talk about today, a workflow where you simply assign, think about how the world, real world works, and you get these results. Here's another example. This car is actually not on this stage. Um, this is an example that we showed at our GTC conference a couple years ago with, with our partner Honda. Um, this is actually the, uh, a CG model, all rendered within our iRay renderer, um, and then using environmental lighting to accurately uh, put that uh, car in that space. Going back to a 50-50 split again, that first example was so popular we did it again. This one, uh, this example happens to be the Portland Armory that was converted into um, an art gallery. Um, in case you're wondering, this one was the CG image. And most of the time spent in this scene was actually in making the actual model as uh, unrefined as possible. Uh, getting the materials and lighting was actually quite quick, and then all the rest of our time was spent uh, dirtying up the geometry, because uh, that was actually the tell in, in seeing whether uh, it was actually uh, real or not. But here are two, uh, uh, two more examples of them together, and then the geometry. So from NVIDIA, we really have two completely different rendering solutions. Uh, we have Mental Ray. You may have heard about this one. Uh, it is. Uh, been in the industry for over two decades. Uh, it's been in the Autodesk products for quite a number of years. Uh, Mental Ray is really designed for the uh, media and entertainment industry. It was, however, the first commercially available physically based rendering workflow uh, coming out in Maya 2007. Um, what we did is we learned a lot from Mental Ray. We learned that adding PBR to an existing renderer did not make it easy to use because you had all the other options available to you, and most of your time was spent learning what not to use, how to stay on the rails, so to speak, so that everything was physically correct. Um, that's the lesson we learned when we created iRay. iRay was PBR from the very beginning. It was also designed for interactivity and, and immediate feedback from the very beginning. So uh, it was something that was immediately appealing to designers. and it going forward is our solution for designers really wanting to predict and present their designs. Now, we also have something called MDL, which is a way to exchange materials between renderers, and this allows both of these rendering solutions to maintain your design intent uh, should you choose to move between them. We'll discuss that a little bit later. So iRay you may not have heard about because it's actually within many products, although never not necessarily called iRay. So for example, within Katia, it's called Live Rendering. But it's been within flagship products for over seven years now, as well as within private products um, and solutions at companies like Lockheed Martin and Honda. These are actually the products that iRay is currently shipping in. Uh, Siemens NX is one of the most recent ones, um, where it is actually powering now all the rendering coming from Siemens NX. 
and between SOLIDWORKS and the SOS systems and CATIA, uh, this is really uh, wrapping up the high-end styling uh, options with, with iRay. But also available in more generally available products like uh, DAS Studio, which is completely free, or Algorithmic Substance Designer and Painter. Here's just a few examples from some of those products. Here is in DAS Studio. DAS Studio is a character, uh, primarily working with characters. But even even though it's designed for characters, uh, people are doing uh, commercial work like this with uh, automotive cars. Automotive, uh, going back to Honda, what Honda uses iRay for is actually their final quality control. Um, they know the accuracy of iRay and they vet their designs before going to manufacturing with iRay to make sure that everything is as expected. This has saved them uh, quite a bit of money uh, in not having to retool manufacturing. Going to more of the exotic, here's an example of a self-driving car uh, uh, prototype being designed uh, completely with iRay. Also iRay in production. Now one good example here is this is the car, this is the same car in a different environment. All that changed was the lighting in the environment. The, the user didn't have to go in and change anything on the materials or, the, uh, or other setups. It just naturally works. And this is one of the benefits that you get from a uh, physically based workflow. Also being used in commercial production with Renault as well as their design studio. So a, they do all of their internal uh, future looking design all, all within uh, with iRay as their proofing tool. Um, also it, what iRay really provides is the ability to simulate light and tough lighting conditions. This one is an example of an interior of a, of a private jet. Um, all of that light is being diffused from the exterior and to get a real sense of the scene, you have to be accurate in how that light is being uh, uh, reflected around the interior. Of course, we're used in uh, commercial, uh, traditional commercial production here as well. Also jewelry design. Um, we have all the spectral qualities respected within iRay for uh, gems. Um, so you get very accurate results when representing jewelry. And this is very, very popular uh, with, uh, with the Bunk Speed, now SolidWorks Visualizer product, and now in Rhino as well. Also in other uh, ways of uh, going from uh, now apparel design into watches. So what this really means for what you need to know about iRay is that it's simple to use because it's physically based, which means that you just have to think like a photographer, like in light the scene as a photographer would, and you will get the results that a camera will. It's also highly interactive. Everything that you see, uh, you get immediate feedback on, so it's easy to get uh, an understanding of all of your uh, uh, decisions. And also, what you see interactively is just a rough proxy of what you're going to get eventually. It is not day and night different. So this means that as you're making your lighting decisions, material decisions, um, while it might be grainy because we're a progressive renderer, um, it is an accurate prediction of what you're going to see eventually. And finally, it's highly scalable. With iRay, you can always make it go faster, whether it is in adding more processors to your machine or even scaling across a network to take advantage of many machines. Now, coming back to predictive design, this is an example that we, we took to the next level where we actually had a physical environment where we took a light booth um, and put the actual physical drill in the light booth, uh, pointed a camera at it, and then put that uh, uh, the resulting screen side by side with the screen coming from uh, 3ds Max, and uh, here we had invited all the attendees from SeaGraph to actually pick the difference. And again, we achieved a 50/50 um, uh, balance on what was accurate and what was actually uh, real uh, within the booth, uh, showing you how accurate you can really get with iRay. Now, this wasn't so much about fooling people or about you know trying to match the real world for uh, that sake, it's about predicting what's not going to be built yet. Here's an example where we use it in NVIDIA within our own designs of the Shield console. The challenge here was to accurately predict what the light pipe was going to do with, within this design. Uh, so the, the, 
the four or five uh, LED light sources were accurately modeled and placed, as well as all the diffusing plastic on the inside. And our designers were able to accurately maneuver uh, their arrangement of components within it to get a clean, linear strip of light um, and be able to preview that within iRay. This saved them dozens of prototypes that they would otherwise had to have done uh, to have, uh, through trial and error, basically, uh, to get the same result. We're then doing it on a much more massive scale. We're building a new headquarters building at NVIDIA. And our challenge here was to simulate all the natural daylight, because this the building's goal was to maximize the use of natural light. Um, this influenced both the architectural design, layout, and even geometry of the building. Uh, and it allowed Gensler architects, uh, who were the uh, designers on this project, to explore many new possibilities uh, and have reliable information on the actual lighting levels while they were doing it. Uh, Today, we're actually taking this one step farther, and we're actually bringing all this output uh, into VR uh, for a one-to-one -one, uh, experience so that you have an immersive, uh, true sense of scale with the environment as well, which is based a little bit later. Another thing in action, um, here we have LAM partners in, in southern LA uh, creating a new stadium, wh which they predicted the actual design completely within iRay and actually replaced their previous uh, lighting simulation software with iRay because it was both accurate and gave them the right imagery. So this was actually using over 30,000 uh, IES profiled lights within the, within the design, uh, all simulated in iRay and allowed them to explore many more possibilities than they were ever able to before. In fact, they credit uh, IRA as allowing them to actually win this design project. Now, this is what we mean by simulation. Uh, on the left-hand side, you actually see the heat map output um, where the designer can actually see the true lux or foot candle output at any point within the space. Uh, as well as seeing uh, the beauty pass or what it actually looks like. And this allowed them to get extremely uh, good information on their design and uh, win, the, win, the, win the project. Now, when you think about predictive design, it's really all about balancing all the elements that go into the uh, rendering workflow. It starts with having an accurate renderer. You need a physically based renderer uh, that, that prides itself on accuracy. Uh, in our case, it's iRay. You need accurate lights. Um, IES profiles are a good start there, but then you also need to be making sure everything is in the proper scale, and then illumination levels are in the proper scale uh, as well. Um, inverse squared fall off on lights really catches you if you, if you don't have everything properly uh, scaled. Then you need everything in the same color space. You need it all linear. You need, uh, a lot of this is left up to the application, but in general, you don't want color management uh, to be getting in the way. You want to do that at the very end, so you want a completely linear workflow. Of course, you need proper UVW mapping coordinates. Uh, this is really up to you. Um, and then the last bit, accurate materials. And this is where people were always falling down, because what we found is that most people were spending their time arguing over if a material was right or not. Is, it, is that really aluminum? Is that, is that really glossy plastic or not? Or are you just making that up? So here we've invested at NVIDIA in creating a library called vMaterials. vMaterials is a collection of over 1,000 verified materials that are as accurate as we can make them and give you a great starting point for making your own designs. Now, vMaterials leverages something called MDL. We uh, had to create MDL because within iRay itself we have different rendering modes and we needed to be able to switch between these rendering modes all the time without you having to adjust your scene. And the key to this was having a material definition that worked across renderers. So here we have um, on the far left we have OpenGL, in the middle we have fast interactive ray tracing, and on the far right we have our photoreal renderer uh, path tracer. All of them using the same materials. Uh, the artist doesn't have to do anything uh, as they switch modes, and MDL makes it all easy. In doing that, we made it possible that MDL could be used across other renderers as well. 
Um, so later on this year, you'll be seeing it adopted within V-Ray. Um, and then Algorithmic, within their Substance Designer and Painter products, are creating a wonderful workflow um, for creating uh, custom MDL as well. In action, here's a couple um, examples. Uh, this scene right here is using iRay Interactive, the fast ray tracer. And I'm going to move over to the next scene, which is uh, basically switching rendering modes. And I'll go back and forth a couple times here. And you'll notice that the reflections near the windshield, and especially in the headlights, are changing, but that the materials are basically rock solid. Um, and that's what you get with MDL consistent material definitions between materials, and then what's actually happening and then the difference in rendering comes down to lighting and how it's bouncing. So MDL in action, here it is within 3ds Max. Here's an extreme case of layering a material, uh, all done by uh, an end user who posted this example on the forum. And then also in Substance Designer. So these are actual procedurals, believe it or not. These are single material procedurals all within the Substance Designer product. Now here you can see how you can uh, network your material to any level of complexity you'd like, output them, and get single materials that are as rich as these. Uh, people within Substance Designer are even taking it to the final result, um, actually using Substance itself uh, for final rendering output because they're finding it uh, so easy to do all their work right there. Now, while we enjoy bringing rendering solutions directly to products, the ability to serve them only happens every once in a while. We're lucky if we have a, a chance or once a decade to be considered uh, just, just the way that uh, products evolve. So we're, NVIDIA is now bringing uh, our rendering technology directly to you in the form of plugins that you can add to your favorite product. So right now, we have plugins for 3ds Max, uh, Maya, Cinema 4D, and Rhino as well as a distributed rendering solution called iRay Server that, that uh, is usable by all of them. Uh, connecting all of these is really MDL, coming back to uh, materials again, because materials are key. So the same V materials can be used in all of these products, um, as well as over to Mental Ray and soon V-Ray, uh, shown down at the bottom. And then all these material definitions can be shared between them. So if you start off in Rhino, for example, um, uh, while you're uh, working on your design and then you need to uh, do your final presentation in Max or Maya, no problem, bring over, the, the, bring over that MDL and everything will be maintained. Now in our solutions, we wanted to make them as integral and seamless as possible. Each one is different because each uh, product is different. The way they relate to you, the opportunities available to you are very different between Maya, Max, Cinema 4D, and Rhino. So this is an example of iRay within Maya. Uh, Maya, uh, here we take advantage of their IPR window. Um, and that upper right is actually your working set environment for working uh, within iRay. Here we are within Rhino. Uh, this is actually your viewport. It's totally interactive. Uh, you can click on things, drag and drop materials there. Um, even this is your working, working uh, viewport within a Rhino when, when made uh, full screen here. And yes, Harley-Davidson does use uh, our plugin here for uh, some of their design work. Now we're coming over to 3ds Max. Uh, iRay within 3ds Max. Uh, our plugin is actually what we call the real iRay. Uh, the version within Max um, is actually built on Mental Ray and doesn't have nearly as many uh, possibilities as uh, this plugin does. So we wanted to. We, we kept on getting uh, complaints from customers going, how come I can't do in 3ds Max with iRay what I, can, what I see iRay doing everywhere else? Well, now you don't have to uh, be left out. The same power that other applications have with iRay is now possible completely for you within 3ds Max. So here's an example of um, uh, iRay being used in the Active Shade window. Um, here again, also within the Active Shade window, uh, showing you the material uh, node network. Um, and finally, uh, also, uh, here we're working with uh, backplates uh, for really uh, quick compositional work. Now, that's enough of me talking and enough of slideware. I'm going to hand it over now to Jay Axe. Jay is our product manager on 3ds Max Rendering Solutions. And he's going to give you a guided tour of the 3ds Max solution in action.
Hello, this is Jay. Um, just checking to make sure that my screen is sharing. Yes, it's all, we're all seeing it. Excellent. Okay, great. Thanks for the intro, Phil. Um, I'm going to show a, a few different data sets. I'll try to go through them fairly quickly. Uh, we'll start with um, uh, the different rendering modes of iRay, and we'll use this interior scene to show that off. So uh, the 3ds Max users out there should feel uh, fairly at home with what you see, and I'll, I'll point out what is iRay and what's part of the, the iRay plugin uh, that we're showing today. So in the, in the top right viewport is the active shade mode, um, uh, which is, which w I can click on any of the different viewports to, um, to switch the, the render view to um, what we'll be rendering in, in active shade. So we should have an update in just a moment. There we go. <clears throat> so I can uh, switch between my viewports. I can use uh, preset cameras. Um, I can also uh, switch to perspective mode, and my, my, the ability to, to do this is so, uh, I get so much feedback because I'm using the iRay interactive mode. So this is uh, what Phil mentioned earlier, that this is um, not the full path traced iRay, which I'll show in a moment, but it's, it's predictive enough that it gets, me, gets you started with uh, your material design or your, your lighting uh, setup. So this is the, the, the fast feedback we're going to get uh, using the, the iRay Plus interactive renderer. And a question I, I often get when I get this far into the demo is what are your resources? So if I, if I scroll down in my render settings, you can see that I'm running on two Quadro M6000s. And if I want to just go down to one M6000, I can show you what the, the, the feedback is with just one. I go back to walkthrough. And I can also switch between some predefined cameras. So we can look at a different part of the room, uh, and I'll go ahead and enable my second GPU. But you can see you still get pretty good feedback with, uh, with just one GPU rendering. Um, something else we can do is switch between uh, different lighting setups uh, pretty quickly on the fly. So we have a, we're, we're doing image-based lighting right now for the environment. Uh, I can switch from uh, an early morning um, IBL is what we call it, to a, a night IBL. We should get that feedback immediately. And uh, one of the, the comments that uh, uh, that we often say for uh, iRay is that you have to think like a photographer. So if you're thinking like a photographer and you go from morning to night, um, you would have to adjust your, the exposure settings of your camera. So we use uh, tone mapping within the plugin to adjust that exposure value so that you can see a little bit brighter. And since it's evening, we're, we have a much warmer light, so I'm going to adjust my white balance on the fly to uh, something a little bit cooler for uh, the evening. And if we want to have a more, um, uh, you know, a, an evening look where it's a, a little bit less uh, illuminated or at least less exposure, you can uh, adjust that on the fly. Now, this is still within the, the preview renderer. So we'll take a look at the, and by preview, I mean the iRay Plus interactive renderer. So I have different, um, optimizations I can do to, to keep my performance going uh, uh, fast for, for that interactive feedback. Um, so if I swing the camera around, let's do something like that, and I can affect the amount of a bounce light. So the, a lot of the light that's, go, that's going on in the scene is, is light bouncing around the scene. So if I limit that down to even less, you can see that we're not even uh, getting light in through the window. So if we increase the bounces, we, we can start seeing more light around the scene. And this is just different ways you can optimize the scene to um, you know, have uh, fast uh, performance and, and feedback. Uh, let me fly around back here a little bit. Okay, let's take a look back over here. Um, another approximation uh, is the, the approximating the bounce light. So if I turn this off, this is what um, the the iRay interactive um, uh, ray tracer is calculating. And by using that approximate bounce light, it's giving me that preview that I was talking about of what the lighting would be in these areas. Um, while we're using the iRay uh, plus uh, interactive render, uh, let me switch back to the main camera. Uh, I'd like to talk about some of the artificial lights that are created in the scene. So, I'll, if I can temporarily go to um, the environment lighting, and we have it as the night IBL, I'm going to turn that off. Okay, so that's going to go to none. So now we're just looking at the interior lighting. And for the sake of the demo, I've used the, 
the timeline to animate the lights turning on and off. So if I move to the next frame, you can see that the lights are completely off. Uh, we have a, a group of lights on the right side of the screen, and then we have another group, and then we can turn everything back on. So if I swing back to that first group, um, switch to another view, something like this, I can select a light source, and I'll go to my Modify panel, um, and you can see that I'm using a uh, an IES profile here. So if I toggle that on and off, you can see that this uh, adds to more accuracy within your design. And so while we're using the iRay Plus Interactive Render, I can move lights around the scene and get feedback very quickly so that I can uh, have a lot of control about how I would predict my, my lighting setup for design. Okay, pull that back. Now, Everything I did so far was, was for fast interactive uh, um, interaction with the scene. And the next step I'd like to do is I'll pull back to um, the, the main camera and let's turn some lights back on. Uh, we'll go ahead and turn on, um, let's put the environment lighting back tonight. That should be fine. And let's turn on all the lights. Now, um, Moving from the predictive, uh, I guess, the, I'm sorry, the preview lighting for uh, this interior space, I'm going to switch over to the iRay Plus renderer that gives you the full simulation uh, of your lighting design. So I'm going to go ahead and hit render. And when I launch the uh, active shade this way, it's um, a floating window as opposed to docked in the viewport. It's just two different ways you can uh, set up your, your workspace, whether you're uh, interacting with the space designing or if you want to have um, uh, a larger, um, uh, I guess, preview of the, of the render. Um, what we have going on now here is we can see the iteration count. So as these iteration count, uh, as the GPUs render, this increases, uh, it will resolve the noise. This is a part of um, iRay and the way uh, it's a, a, a progressive renderer. So as this uh, continues to render, uh, we have a better preview of what the, the scene uh, will look like. And I can use the same um, interactive workflow with both renderers. So I'll really quickly go down to uh, the lighting setup and let's, let's switch to a physical sky. Um, the physical sky uh, is representing the uh, a procedural system to rec represent the actual light values as, as a simulation. So that's why the screen or the render becomes very bright. So I would have to expose down to expose for those um, real to life values. Um, and I've created this little script that uh, so that I can analyze my interior space with the, the natural daylight. I can move it to the left and that takes it earlier in the day and I can move it to the right to move it um, you know, later in the afternoon. Now, in terms of predictive design, we have another tool that we call um, uh, Enable Analysis. And so we have a good view on the space. I'm going to switch to a higher camera angle. There we go. So by hitting this uh, Enable Analysis, this switches it into, uh, it kind of looks like a heat map, but we call this a radiance mode. And it's set to an automatic value, but um, if I set the custom uh, Lux values to, oh, about, um, uh, I, natural daylight would be at the highest about 150,000 lux. So if, if we go down to what would be comfortable like in the shade, if you were under a tree, that would be uh, 20,000. And, and you can immediately see that looking at the, um, um, the false colors diagram here that this is showing, as you would expect, the, the direct sunlight to be much brighter than what would it would be in a, in a shady environment. So the energy in the scene is quite um, comfortable for, for most of the areas, but you can, uh, as is expected from the direct sunlight, uh, you have much more intensity. And I can also change my uh, time of day. So you're using the same um, material setup, uh, lighting setup to do this analysis on uh, natural daylight. Um, the next step I want to show you for uh, uh, analyzing this, the, the scenes, uh, the energy from light sources is what would be comfortable for um, the artificial lighting. So I can go back to the uh, um, environment lighting and we'll, t we'll, we'll turn off that sun and sky system and now we're going to want to look at the, the, the lights that are on the wall. So this is the artificial lighting. And what's comfortable for um, uh, working at your desk or having uh, just an interior space is between uh, about 200 and 1,000 um, 
uh, as a, a lux value. So, and you could even go down to something like, I guess, 500 to make this very apparent. And I'll switch to a different camera angle too. So you can see that the, the energy from the, the light sources, there's a group of lights overhead and there's a few on, on, on each uh, side of the room. Uh, the, the intensity here is, is quite comfortable for uh, an interior space. And you can use this to evaluate the, the, the type of light sources um, that you would want to install uh, with your lighting and fixtures. And, and I mentioned IES profiles uh, earlier. These profiles are what can be obtained from lighting manufacturers uh, in order to do this predictive design. And at any time, I can turn off uh, the enable analysis mode, and then we're looking back into the beauty render. And one thing that I like to reiterate for everyone is that Using the tone mapper to do this artistic, rep uh, I'm sorry, this predictive representation of the, um, the visual render, like the beauty pass, has no effect on the, the energy of the light. So we can change the white balance, uh, the exposure settings, just like you would with a, a camera. Uh, let me go back to uh, something a little cooler. And even with those adjustments, if I go back to my analysis, we still have the same results. So it's a, it's a good feedback in order to uh, know that if you make any adjustments to the scene uh, uh, for, for your design choices, that these are two ways of getting um, feedback within the same uh, rendering context. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is materials. So we're going to switch to a different scene for that. Let me close that down for a moment. Um, Phil mentioned earlier um, that for iRare we use uh, MDL, which is Material Definition Language, and uh, the, the verified materials that we've created at, at uh, NVIDIA that are as realistic as we can create in, um, um, for predictive design, uh, I'm going to show a few examples of those and how you may use them. Um, let me pull up the Material Editor. And I can, kind of, I can show it from two different uh, perspectives in terms of uh, the design workflow. Um, on one end, you may want to uh, create a material or use an example of the V materials that it is a uh, completely closed system, meaning this material was designed for, for a specific purpose. And we don't want to offer too many parameter controls. Okay, so I have this granite material um, that I'd like to show on uh, uh, within the scene, and I guess to take a step back, um, we can review materials in, on, on spheres or shader balls, but uh, what I'd like to show today is um, how you can use your entire asset or your scene to review your materials, and you can do this all interactively with iRay. So uh, to pull up the render settings for a moment, and if I scroll down to uh, a feature of the plugin um, that's called Material Override, I can enable that, and I can pull this material into the material override so that we can uh, temporarily preview um, what this material would look like you know, in the context of, an, uh, of any object that we have in the scene. And I can do the same interactive workflow so I can look at it from different angles um, for this material. Now, now going back to uh, the comment I made about uh, the closed system. So this material, um, ha was created by uh, um, material designers at NVIDIA uh, for, for this granite. And the, the only the parameters that are exposed are what uh, we believe are accurate in what you could possibly create for a material in real life. So you could adjust the reflective value of this, but you cannot change. You, you could change the, and you can also change the, um, I guess, the, the texture uh, mapping for it. But aside from that, the, the material properties of the MDL should, should not be adjusted for your predictive design process. So that's, that's the one extreme. Um, the next thing I'd like to show is um, how you can um, have a material and actually have more parameters to adjust, whether it may be for um, uh, predictive design and materials or um, for artistic choices. So I have another um, V material uh, catalog for fabrics, and I'm just going to quickly uh, pull different materials on the override so we could see what uh, a velvet material might look like. Let me pull the camera back down. There we go. So we have a velvet material. Uh, we could try a leather. 
And this is all using the, um, uh, actually for this workflow, I'm not using the IRA interactive workflow. I'm using the full um, IRA path tracing results. So this is as predictable as the, uh, we can make the materials. Um, I'd like to show a fabric material and um, actually let's show, um, where is that one right here maybe? Let's try this guy. Yeah, I'll show a few more. Okay, let's show one that's in the scene. Okay, so if I have a scene that's a material that I pulled from this catalog and I worked on it a little bit more, I can pull that into um, the override so we can review that material. Um, and if I double click on it, we can look at the parameters. There we go. So the material I created for the, the wrap um, started from an AV material that had a, a very simple uh, fabric base. And I added a uh, flip-flop paint just to add a nice effect to it that gave it a sheen. So I can use this eyeball to toggle that feature on and off. So this is what the, the V material looked like when it started. And this was the enhancement I made to it. So we're using a, a layering system. And here on the left, you can see this is the um, the, the entire uh, material structure. And the weight is quite low, so I'll, for, I'll temporarily make it a little bit higher so you can see a, you know, a very strong effect that it does. So you can turn these layers on and off to uh, adjust uh, the material design. So this would be for if you want to create a new material based off of an existing view material. And if you don't like working in, within the, um, as a, an override, you can also work on it within the context of, of your scene. So I'll, I'll turn off the material override. And the one last uh, thing I'll show for uh, material layering is, let me go ahead and zoom in on this pillow. So this material as well started with a base that was a V material, and I put these stripes on it as an enhancement of the design. Uh, so let me pull back a little bit and we'll look at that material. So this one has a few more uh, layers, and I'll, I'll collapse them down so you can see the few different uh, uh, additional layers that I created. So uh, the base was uh, the V material, and I went ahead and made a, a paint, and I added a gloss finish on it. And I did them separately so I could um, uh, review the material uh, as you would, I guess, create it with multiple layers uh, in, in real life. So if I disable the gloss finish, we can see just the paint. And if I wanted to adjust the paint, I, you know, I could change it to a blue color, you know, change it however I'd like. Um, and if I like the way this looks and maybe I want to review it with a different lighting setup, I can use that same workflow where I go back to um, the environment lighting and we'll switch to uh, an exterior lighting setup. And let's go ahead and turn that gloss finish back on. So we're going to see what it looks like. So we try to make it very flexible in the plugins that you can choose different lighting setups, you can layer your materials, you can use uh, flattened materials that are, have less parameter choices, uh, but the idea is to have uh, various different workflows depending on uh, what type of materials you're trying to create. And that uh, concludes the, um, the material part of, of the demo. Um, I can go ahead and, well, we have a few more minutes. Um, should we open to questions hey. or do you want to go to uh, uh, um, the next scene? Why don't you just pass it back to me? Okay. Sounds good. That was great. Thanks, Jay. All right. Uh, that was a great example of one of our uh, plugins in action. Um, thanks again, Jay. One of the things that makes everything that Jay was doing possible is um, scalability. So we take advantage of all the processors in your machine with iRay, whether they be CPUs or GPUs. We then also allow you to scale um, across your network in a variety of ways. Um, it's very easy to understand what your performance is going to be with iRay for a given uh, GPU processor. We scale linearly pretty much across cores and clock. Um, so up and down our product line, it's very predictable what type of a performance you're going to get. Uh, at the top, big green bar there, that's a VCA, that's an 8 GPU machine, uh, just showing you that you can always go faster with iRay. Um, we then allow you to scale outside of the machine, so we have an iRay server product. Uh, this is software that runs on the hardware of your choice, um, and 
then you can coordinate all of your machines together to make a, a single image rendering go all the faster, um, as well as uh, the VCA that I just spoke about. Um, all of these uh, work in conjunction with all of our plugins, as well as some of the third-party integ IRA integrations as well. I'm going to cross this really quickly. So our goal with, uh, with these plugins is to evolve them quickly. Um, as IRA evolves, we want to get, out, get you out the newest features possible. An example of that is uh, VR snapshots. Uh, this capability was just added to IRA, and then the next month we brought that out in the actual IRA plugins themselves. Um, and this is an example of uh, uh, the VR snapshot uh, output capability within 3ds Max that you just saw uh, a minute ago with Jay. Um, I want to conclude really quickly on what's happening with Mental Ray, uh, especially if you're a Maya user. Um, so. Mental Ray has been uh, used in feature films and production around the world for uh, quite a long time. It's been in Maya for over a dozen years. Uh, Autodesk is going a different way now with Maya 2017, uh, but we're proud to say that we're working with Autodesk to uh, take ownership of that going forward. So Mental Ray for Maya uh, will be available directly from those creating it. It will be available directly from NVIDIA uh, uh, starting at the end of October. Uh, we've been in beta with people with over oh, several hundred sites since February, and you're welcome to join that beta. Uh, just email us at mental-ray-beta at nvd.com, and we'll bring you on board. Um, the newest Maya, uh, we were able to uh, add things to it that we've been wanting to do for many years. Um, but other priorities uh, kept us from doing that. Uh, we introduced a new global illumination method that is unified, much simpler to use, uh, becomes one simple quality slider that's both faster than before, um, and then it's also GPU accelerated. We've also made uh, Mental Ray interact within the Maya viewport, and when you combine that type of interactivity with the performance, you get a fantastic lighting uh, workflow and look development workflow now with Metal Ray for Maya. Just a couple examples of the, of the performance increase we're talking about here. Um, uh, on the far left, uh, running on dual uh, 14 core Xeons, um, we're now two and a half times faster uh, than that with the new method on the same hardware. And then adding one GPU uh, increases it that much more. And a dual GPU system like Jay was just working on uh, literally turns a day into an hour or an hour into two minutes. Yeah. Another quick example showing you that um, even an exterior scene benefits from uh, the speed up in global illumination. Um, here, again, uh, a, a very, very generous uh, speed ups with the new global illumination happening within uh, Mental Ray uh, coming to you soon from uh, NVIDIA. And to get, together, we really believe that uh, we have uh, both sides of the equation for you uh, for physically-based rendering as well as creative versus design rendering um, uh, at NVIDIA uh, with MDL materials uh, tying them all together. So with that, I think we can open it up for questions. Thank you, Philip. Um, yeah, please go ahead. There's there are no questions so far, so I'm gonna prompt everybody okay. to you know speak up. Um, I think they're all speechless as I am, <laughs> and um, but yeah, let's just wait a few minutes. Um, if you don't mind, Philip, I will take the screen back and uh, and say um, you know um, thanks for attending. And uh, if questions come in, well will be ready. In the meantime, I would like to um, show you, hold on a second, where you can find iRay on our site. And um, it's there and soon, hopefully, um, Mental Ray as well. Um, so come visit us and um, we have a, a couple of questions. Uh, what's in store for Rhino? Um, what's in the store for Rhino? So um, uh, Rhino is being, up, uh, being updated with uh, VR uh, output uh, right now. And longer term, we're taking a look at the new Rhino 6 and what we can really take advantage of there. Um, Neil and Associates did a great job making it possible for a render to become much more integrated in Rhino. And we're looking at uh, doing exactly that. So. Um, uh, incremental improvements for Rhino 5, but for Rhino 6, we're hoping to do great things. 
great. We're so excited. And uh, for Cinema 4D, uh, would it work uh, on the Cinema 4D for Mac as well as the Cinema 4D for Windows? Yeah, that's a great question. So today, uh, the answer is yes. Um, and it's a little embarrassing, but we've been learning uh, how to productize on the Macintosh. And so while the code has been running great on the Mac, um, our ability to um, license and update on the Mac and even install uh, is what we've been uh, struggling with. So if you go up onto our beta, you can get the Mac version. It, were, it is exactly the same version as the one we released for Windows last April. Um, it's, it's production proven. It just doesn't have um, the little bits necessary to make it a product. But uh, the official support for it uh, will be coming out uh, later this month uh, for the Mac. And then from here on, we'll be supporting the Mac just fine. Great news. Can you speak more uh, about the sharing of materials with V-Ray through MDL? What will the workflow be like? OK, good question. So every product that adopts MDL, of course, is going to be on its own for what it wants to do to expose them. In the case of uh, V-Ray, uh, they're going to have the ability to load an MDL, um, but not save it. That's because they're, the, their general materials, the general V-Ray materials, uh, have many more options that, that, that are basically not physically based. So it's, it, uh, you, you can't have an exact mapping. Um, but on loading, you can. So with their, their intent is to keep them native. Um, so if you load MDL, they're going to keep them MDL. They're not going to do a conversion to V-Ray. OK. There's another question about the, a possible release for Rhino. I don't know if you have more info than I do, uh, but I, I don't think we have a date. And I think if we did, we would not be allowed to say. So I don't know. Uh, what's your um, what's your intelligence um, for version six? Yes. Yeah, uh, you have to really look to McNeil for that. Yes, I agree. Okay, will the Rhino version have the node-based graph manipulation? Do you know? Um, is that Grasshopper? Um, I'm asking Dave. Dave, is that Grasshopper? Grasshopper, you you mean? I'm waiting for. Um, yes. Okay, yeah, so um, the Grasshopper is going to become more integral. Uh, we know that. Um, it's an incredibly cool tool. We do support instancing and uh, within iRay, and so what Grasshopper is really doing is creating a lot of instances, usually. And um, we're, we're looking at supporting that directly. Okay, and Dave also comments, but it could reside in the iRay panel, right? What could reside in the iRay panel? Good question. Dave, we're listening. Um, let me see if he can um, elaborate the node base. Are you talking about a node? If you're talking about a node-based uh, material workflow, um, we have, so we have a node-based in the sense that you can create any arbitrary layer structure you want to within Rhino today. Um, we just have a GUI challenge for presenting it to you. <laughs> so right now, every single layer becomes its own little floating window. Um, if you are creating really complex uh, networks, we actually suggest that you go use Substance Designer and then bring the MDL over. Um, it, they have just, they have, they're ahead of us by a decade in terms of having a wonderful uh, creation experience. OK, I hope this answers your question, Dave. And this is it for questions. Thank you so much, Philip. And uh, as I said, come visit Novage and uh, check out, you know, uh, iRay for 3X and Maya. And we also have the Quadro and Sue Mental Ray. So um, this is a one-stop shop for all your design need. Um, and also, you know, check us out on YouTube and uh, Facebook or Plus and Twitter for all the latest uh, news and um, upgrade improvement uh, uh, software scoops. Um, and I want to remind you that our next webinar will be on Visual Arc 2.0 for Rhino. And to rewatch today's webinar um, or previous ones, 
check out our Novage YouTube and Vimeo channels, our webinar playlists as webinars for every software taste. Thanks again for joining us, everyone. Thanks uh, to the NVIDIA team, Jay and Philip. Great presentation. Have a great day and goodbye to the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.